So, uh, my name is Indra Hovland and I run the Energy Program at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And I am here lecturing at the OEC Academy in Bishkek uh, about uh, energy politics, mainly about petroleum politics. As part of a, a joint project, some extensive cooperation between uh, my institute, Lupi, and the OEC Academy. And uh, today we've had uh, a brief introduction to energy politics, um, to terminology, uh, to uh, the history of the petroleum sector, uh, and we're now going to start on our first main topic, which is energy security. And <clears throat> I'll just start again by returning to the history that, that we covered, and to the First World War, which was a turning point for uh, demand for petroleum uh, and for uh, the role of petroleum in energy security. Um, when, before the war, uh, all of the major military powers were uh, basing their strategies on uh, men walking and horses. Um, and uh, the common standard was that uh, you would need one horse uh, for every three soldiers. At the beginning of the war, uh, Britain had about 800 military vehicles for military purposes, and these were mostly requisitioned from wealthy private individuals who happened to own the car. By the end of the war, there had been a dramatic change. Um, Britain had 56,000 trucks, 36,000 cars, uh, the U.S. had shipped over 50,000 vehicles of different kinds to Europe. <clears throat> and in these few years, it had built over 15,000 planes. So you can imagine the uh, dramatic industrial, uh, social, uh, economic changes uh, that were associated with this shift. And the world was never the same. It was never the same again. After this, uh, we've never gone away from uh, petrol-driven vehicles and planes since. In addition, this changed <clears throat> the death toll in war. It changed how you do military strategy because you could suddenly move your forces much more quickly. It changed transportation outside a war context, and it. Uh, put energy security on a whole new level of importance. Um, energy became important for your military force and your military force power uh, capacity became important for your ability to secure energy for your society. A common definition of energy security nowadays uh, would define it as a condition in which a country and all of its citizens and businesses have access to sufficient energy resources at reasonable prices for the foreseeable future, free from serious risk of major disruptions of service. <clears throat> I prefer this definition, um, and uh, not least because it's is quite general and because it focuses on the risk of disruption. There are also other definitions which are more purely uh, economic, uh, but they become so broad that I don't think uh, it, they, they function very well for analytical purposes. So we'll focus on disruptions and survival of society. <clears throat> there are many subcategories of energy security, but one simple way of dividing energy security is in security of supply for consumers and security of demand for producers. Now, if you look at security of supply first, this involves the non disruption of supply, the supply be kept at reasonable and stable price levels, which means that it's not just enough to have some oil or gas flowing, uh, you need it within a price range that where you can actually afford it. 
It means that you need dependable transportation, and in order to have all these things, a uh, common strategy would be to diversify your sources of supply. Because if you diversify, if you have many different small sources instead of uh, one or a few big ones, if there's a disruption in one place, you can uh, rest more on the others. <clears throat> and you need to not only diversify your sources, for example, to all the countries around the Persian Gulf, uh, it doesn't help if you don't have diversified supply routes. Because you get, get it from different countries, but if they all have to go through the Suez Canal, you're still very vulnerable to the disruption of the Suez Canal. Another strategic aspect of this can be to avoid social conflict and interstate conflict. <clears throat> and also, although less dramatic, you have to keep up the big investments that are needed in energy security, in energy infrastructure, in order to avoid uh, disruptions due to accidents, which is also a serious concern. We now turn to the other major subcategory of energy security, security of demand. My view is that security of demand isn't genuinely uh, comparable to security of supply. It's not actually clear that we can think of security of demand as a type of energy security. <clears throat> because for something to be energy security, it has to be, in my slightly narrow conservative view, it has to be about survival, about the basis of life. Um, and security of demand, although important, is about uh, profits, it's about a stable income, which obviously is very important for those countries that export oil and gas, uh, but it's not necessarily about survival. Because if you don't have energy to heat your homes, to cook food, and so on, that can be a question of survival. But nonetheless, it's still worth including security of demand, because security of supply depends on security of demand. Security of supply, <coughs> if the countries that export energy don't have stable income from this, uh, don't have stability of export markets, uh, they won't invest enough, they won't be cooperative. And that in turn will uh, in, can endanger security of supply for the importing countries. So all those of security of demand in its own right uh, may not be very valid as a part of energy security, it is an important subsidiary component of uh, supply uh, security. We've spoken a bit about uh, OPEC earlier today. We'll now return to, to um, OPEC uh, because it is a key actor for energy security. Um, the 1950s, after the Second World War, were a golden period for the international oil companies, um, which went around the world extracting oil in different places, <coughs> and took most of the profits, and almost all of the oil went to the Western home markets of these IOCs. As mentioned, in, 19, in 1960, five countries Five developing countries, which are also oil exporters, founded the organization of petroleum exporting countries, a cartel. This got uh, very little attention uh, at the time, uh, a very small announcement in The Economist, and then no attention, until, <clears throat> uh, although things did gradually develop in the background. So, Founded in 1960, in 1961, Qatar joined, Libya 1962, Indonesia 1962 also, and so on. Ultimately, OPEC became quietly, gradually, a larger and powerful, more powerful organization. And for this cartel, 
to be powerful, it needs to control a substantial amount of world oil exports and production. Uh, because only that way, if it's only if it controls enough of the production, can it uh, affect prices when it uh, reduces exports. And by the 1970s, OPEC controlled over 50% of world oil production. Still wasn't getting much attention <clears throat> until 1973, the Yom Kippur War, when OPEC stepped in, uh, or when the US was supporting Israel, and OPEC, still dominated by Arab countries, stepped in uh, against to, to uh, put pressure on the US, uh, creating long gas lines in the US, and the first uh, global oil crisis. Nowadays, OPEC is a weaker organization, it controls a smaller percentage of world oil production, but um, there is a question of shades of OPEC. And by shades of OPEC, I mean countries which are not OPEC members, uh, but which are also not Western countries and not necessarily very close to the West. Countries such as Russia. Definitely not a member of OPEC, definitely not the West. Uh, or at least it's not at the moment. <clears throat> and if you look at OPEC and these countries together, they control a very large amount of world uh, oil production and reserves. We have something called the strategic ellipse, which is this area you see here of the Middle East, the Caspian, you could extend it into this part of Eastern Africa too, and about 70% of world oil reserves are located here, and 66% of world gas reserves. So this means that the world for its energy security is very dependent on this part of the world, geologically, but also in terms of political and military stability. And as you also know, this is one of the more tense parts of the world. Uh, you have the conflict between uh, Israel and several other countries in the neighborhood. You have the role, the controversial role of the US in the region. You have uh, old conflicts between Iran and Iraq, tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and uh, almost none of the countries in the region are uh, democratic, uh, with the exception of Israel. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this risk for energy security is uh, at the how much national oil companies control and how much international oil companies control. And Depending on your method of calculations, uh, the national companies now control uh, close to 80% of world oil. <clears throat> and uh, these companies are, per definition, under the control of uh, various states, most of them non-Western, almost all of them non-Western. The U.S. doctrine, which is very important in this area, <clears throat> has, uh, since the 1970s, it has been that free trade is the only way to secure energy security for the world, um, especially in oil, which is traded on a global market or tightly interlinked regional markets. <clears throat> and the U.S. view is that you can't go it alone. You can't just secure your own oil somewhere and sit with that. Um, everybody is affected by everybody else's actions because it's one united market. And any barrel of oil that's used or that's produced or uh, consumed or saved or not produced affects, contributes to the totality of supply and demand, which again affects prices and energy security. And if a country wants to um, secure oil only for itself, to lock in oil, um, it can do that physically. Um, but 
uh, ultimately, if it keeps that oil cheaply for itself, it, it will amount to a subsidy of that oil, which I can explain more later on. Um, and if you want to subsidy oil for yourself, you're still ultimately playing the market price. You insist that the government or somebody else is paying it. Uh, and this has been uh, something that the U.S. has criticized other countries of, including China. Uh, George Bush uh, famously said about China, warned the Chinese not to lock in oil. But what about the U.S.? <clears throat> Isn't the investment in the BTC a kind of uh, attempt to control oil? What about its criticism of Russia? What about the invasion of Iraq? Um, <clears throat> a lot of these uh, uh, actions from the US side look a lot like locking oil. On the other hand, the US argument is that it is not trying to lock in oil for itself, it's trying to maximize production for the world market, which benefits anybody, everybody. Uh, this is a difficult question, and uh, my view is that different actors in the U.S. probably have a different understanding of what they're trying to do. Uh, but there is some truth to the fact that oil is a global market, and therefore controlling it in or one place for one uh, consuming country, importing country, uh, doesn't really help it very much at the financial level, objectively speaking. Thank you very much.